Well, first service was, was just a blessing. Uh, it was a blessing in the sense that after the service, I was given a little note card by somebody. This little note card, and it had a card in it. And this person took notes of the whole message. They're eight years old. Eight years old. And I'm going to read it to you at the end because I thought it was, uh, wow, it was really great that, that they did this and they heard everything I said and wrote it all down. An eight-year-old girl. Amazing. So um, get your pens and pencils out. I don't want them afterwards. You can keep them. But we should be writing this stuff down. You know, we should be highlighting. We should write the Greek words and the definitions if they come up so that we ready ourselves for what will come ahead of us. This is a Bible-believing church. We believe Genesis to Revelation completely, that not one word is in error, and that we can believe everything that's in it will come to pass. We believe the historical evidence, we believe the prophetic evidence, we believe everything that that the apostles wrote in, in the New Testament and all of the prophets in the Old Testament, we believe this is God's word, He wrote it through these men, and we believe that, and we believe that we need to know it. Why? Because we will be given the opportunity to share our faith with others. We will be given that opportunity one way or another, whether it's through a loved one or a neighbor. Someone will ask you, why do you believe in Jesus Christ? And you need to have an answer. Someone said, has Christianity given you a unique sense of pressure? Brought by living a faithful life in the midst of persecution. Good question. Do you sense that pressure because of your life? Because you live for Jesus Christ? Is there a sense of pressure there? And if there is, that's good. That means you're doing something right. That means that you're on track and that you are a light or that you're salt. It's amazing how we don't suffer the pressures and persecution that the early church suffered here in the United States or in some other eastern areas of the world where they suffer persecution for their faith. We have more liberty, we have more grace, and I believe it's because of our founding fathers. It's because of the, uh, the foundation that was laid for Christianity and God has continued to bless us. And I, I don't have a problem living that blessed life. We're blessed to be here in the United States. You are blessed, are we not? In fact, I would say we're spoiled. Are we not spoiled? We are very spoiled. Even the poorest of people are spoiled here in the United States. And thank God for that, that we are and that we get to live here and enjoy things. You know, last night we had our our couple's dinner and it was just a blast. It was a blast to get together. The theme was 50s and and so some people dressed like Fonzie, you know. (laughs) Others, you know, had their normal attire with the suit and tie and slacks and so forth. You know, we had fun and the food was great. The atmosphere was great. You know, it was just a great time. Uh, They had a game where the husbands had to recite a poem to their wives, but they had to do it in a very romantic way and really pronounce dramatically, you know, and then whoever had the greatest applause was was the winner, you know. And so guess who won? <laughs> I won because I knew what they were asking for. <laughs> it, it, you know, it was just fun, and, and I loved it. I love that I can believe in Christ, and I can live in a state that doesn't persecute me because I believe in Christ, and that we can have a dinner like that, and it's focused around Christ because there was a message, you know, of hope and, and of building our relationships and so forth, and, and you still not have the world a part of it, you know. It wasn't a party at my house or someone else's house or a friend where people are drinking and then eventually get into fights and arguments, you know, and then the police show up and then ambulance show up and gunshots are going. I've been at those. Been at those plenty of times. You know, no, this was this was just a wholesome Christian event and we were able to do it. We're blessed. We're spoiled. You know, we're spoiled. What do you do with spoiled children? What do you do with spoiled children? You know, you take away things. You allow them to go through stuff. You allow them to be persecuted a little bit so that it wakes them up that they shouldn't be spoiled so much, you know, and they need to really value what they have. And and I think that we're headed that way, the United States. I think we are. 
as we see what's going on today. So we're going to talk about these pressures that we have as Christians. And even while we're suffering, even as we're being persecuted in this world, and we are, I mean, what's the worst persecution that you've probably have? You think on the top of your head, you're probably thinking, I'm trying to witness to my family, and they call you a Jesus freak. Ah, why would you do that? You know, and it hurts. Or, or, or they say, you're an unloving person. Really? I just shared the gospel with you and it's probably the most loving thing a person can do and you're saying I'm unloving because I don't go to your parties where you get drunk because I don't participate in these things and you're saying I'm unloving? No, you just don't understand. But that's the worst that we experience, isn't it? Family members mocking us or laughing at us and oh, here he comes, quiet, you know, and they make their little gestures and so forth. And yet... Through those suffering and persecution, we need to take the opportunity to share our faith because it is the most loving thing you can do is to share your faith with people even though they may not want to hear it. They need to hear it. I really believe that their spirit is yearning for it. That God puts a desire in their heart to seek out something to fulfill them and that is Jesus Christ. And that we come along and we water and we plant and it just draws them closer to the Lord. And so it is our responsibility to take those opportunities to share our faith. Why don't we share our faith? Because we're spoiled children. We don't have to share our faith, right? We, ha- we have the TV evangelist to share the faith for us. We have great glory at, at the Harvest Crusade. Every year, thousands go. Why do I need to do it? You know, and so forth. It's kind of like a police officer. You know, and he goes to work. And and the sergeant says, look, you need to go to the range and and practice shooting gun. What for? My partner knows how to shoot a gun. Why do I need to know how to shoot a gun? Well, you're an officer and you protect people out there. And you may get into a situation where you may use your gun. Well, then you come out and you shoot them. I don't have to learn how to. No, you do need to learn how to shoot a gun. It's your responsibility to learn how to shoot a gun. And you can say that about anything, right? You're a teacher. You need to study your material in order to teach it to others. You know, whatever you do, you need to be ready to do it. We need to be ready to share the gospel with those that are around us. And so preparing ourselves. Last week we we finished off in verse 12 of 1 Peter chapter 3 where it says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, stopping there, Peter changes direction, and he starts talking about those that are suffering for their faith in Jesus Christ, and how they should handle it. The only way to handle it is in the hope that we have in Jesus. It's the only way is our faith and our trust in Him, that He has our very lives in the palm of His hand, that He knows every hair on our head. He actually knows how many less every day you lose every night, you know, as you get older and older. He knows everything about us, and He loves us, and He cares about us. And knowing who He is, and knowing how much He loves us and cares about us, and that He protects us, we can have hope in Him in spite of the persecution. So let's talk about this Christian hope, starting in verse 13. I'm going to give you some meanings here so that you can write them down and then kind of expound upon it quickly. And then I want to spend some time in one verse talking about sharing our faith. So verse 13. And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? So... What person that's looking to harm you because you're a follower, and that is of Jesus Christ, you profess Him as your Lord and Savior, you've given Him your heart, you know He's the only way to get to the Father in heaven because He's the truth, the way, and the life, and you profess that for doing good. What can He do to you? The word harm there is including all hostile acts towards against you. Any activities that would bring damage against you. Any mockeries and whatsoever. So who can really mock you? Who can really hurt you? Who can really harm you? You know, nobody. Nobody can. You could be zealous for the Lord. And that's what the word follower means here. It's a person that is zealous for the Lord. That is willing to take a step of faith out and share its faith with other people. Not one that just sits back and is spoiled as we've been talking about but one who literally gets out there and shares their faith. Now, 
we really don't experience the type of persecution that the early church experienced. I mean, many of these persecuted Christians are dying. They're losing their lives for their faith in Jesus Christ. We do have Christians. In fact, some statistics show that more Christians are dying today than ever before for their faith. Not in the United States, though. In other Muslim-occupied nations where men and women who believe in Jesus and are sharing actively are giving up their lives for Jesus Christ. And because of that, I heard one statistic that millions of Muslims are coming to the Lord because of it. In, in light of the persecution and so forth, the Spirit begins to move. And that's when you begin to see the growth in the church, when there's persecution in the church. And that's why I call for persecution. I pray God persecute the church because it needs a, a time of persecution in the United States again to wake them up. I was sharing last week how we went to a conference and there's a threat by the government to take away what you would call housing allowance for pastors. Now, a housing allowance is tax-free. It's a benefit for being a pastor. It's been there for a while, and it's to really strengthen those that are willing to give up their livelihood for the gospel message, and it just helps them a little bit. Well, normally, and believe this or not, there are a lot of churches that don't get into the political area. They just don't like to. They think that we shouldn't be there, and I disagree. We are in it all the way up to our knees my wife loves the political area. We like to fight against the government when it's wrong and it's infringing our Christian rights and so forth. So we're very active in that. But normally, a lot of churches aren't. But as soon as pastors heard that their housing allowance might be taken away, guess what? They're like, oh no, that can't happen. And they started fighting against it. Isn't that interesting? A little persecution and they all of a sudden want to get in there and be active. First of all, that speaks sadly for those pastors that all they're concerned about is their housing allowance. You know That's sad. That's the only reason that they would get involved. But see, that has to happen sometimes. Let's take away something, and God says, I'll wake you up that way if I take it away from you. Today, the worst that we get is you know, a little mockery. Peter, what Peter is saying here is, look, nobody can really harm you because of your faith in Jesus Christ. They can't harm you spiritually. You know, Physically, they can. You know, you could preach on the corner and they could throw a rock at you and it will hurt. You know, it will cause some damage, but that's not what Peter's talking about. He's talking about our eternal position in Christ Jesus. You can't take that away. You can't take away the joy that's in my heart. You can't take away my faith in Jesus Christ. You can't take away my position in heaven already. You can kill me and take my body and I'm in the presence of the Lord. Hey, praise God, go for it. You know, I'm willing to die if I have to for it, you know but you can't take away the peace of God in my life. It was during World War II that a Christian boy of 12 refused to join a certain movement there in Europe. This is what they said to him. Don't you know that we have the power to kill you? And the boy said to them, don't you know that I have the power to die for Christ? Wow, that's some insight. Yeah, you could kill me, but I have the power to die for Christ. Because he knew where he would go. He knew his eternal state. They couldn't really harm him. No one can take away your salvation if you really believe it. Those that fear for their lives are those that don't really believe in their eternal salvation. I'm here to tell you that your salvation is secure. Eternal life has already been set. And if you believe in Christ, and that's all it takes, John 5.13 tells us, if you believe, you have eternal life. It's very clear. So no one can take away your salvation. Then he says, but even if you should suffer for righteous sake, you are blessed. So if you're doing the right things, if you're sharing the message, if you're living for God, and you are suffering for that righteous living, you're blessed. You're a happy person is what he's saying. Yeah, they'll hurt you physically, but not spiritually. Rejoice in the Lord because of it. And do not be afraid of their threats or their troubles. Now, the word afraid there means to make timid or to be frightened. Now, that's a tough one. That's a tough one when you're living in the flesh. When you're living in the Spirit, it's not so tough. Peter is quoting from Isaiah chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. 
who Isaiah was being persecuted, the Jews were being persecuted. And they were very intimidated by their enemy and feared for their lives. Here Peter tells us we don't have to be intimidated, nor do we have to fear for our lives. And yet, we do, don't we? That natural man, the flesh, does fear. It does fear. And so what do we need to do so that we're not fearing for our lives? What do we need to do? We need to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ is what we need to do. I remember I had um, been sharing the gospel at downtown Riverside before they built that big wreck building there in front of the bus station. Uh, It was all empty. And so we would go down there every Friday night We'd spend at least an hour in prayer before we went down there. It's not a good area, a lot of drugs, prostitution, things like that. Uh, me and this friend of mine would just spend hours, an hour or so, an hour and a half or so, just praying, asking God to open up doors and protect us, you know, it, just everything, empower us. And then we'd go out there and we'd just start walking around with our Bibles and tracts and just speaking with people all day long and sharing. Well, this young man was there and he had a sweatshirt, you know, hood on there and so forth and looked like a little hoodlum just kind of, walking around, probably selling drugs, who knows. And so we started sharing with them. Both of us were just there, and we started sharing about Jesus Christ. Do you know Jesus Christ? Have you heard of him? Oh, yeah, I know who he is, and so forth. And he'd ask us questions. Do you believe in him? Yeah, we believe him. We've given him our lives. And we're sharing back and forth about the gospel. And then he puts his hand into his, his sweat pocket, and he points it at us like this. Never branded a gun, but he said, I've got a gun here. Do you really believe in this Jesus Christ? Are you willing to die for him? And we both looked at each other, and almost immediately we said, yeah, we are. And we kept preaching to him and just sharing the love of Jesus with him. Now, afterwards, we were talking about it, and we just thought, why weren't we scared? Why didn't we get intimidated? It wasn't even on our minds. We just kept doing it. In fact, we told the guy, yeah, we're willing. Go ahead, shoot us, man. We'll just go to heaven. That's all you're doing. You're actually helping us, you know? And so we were rejoicing. We were Blessed, we were happy about it. And afterwards, as we were talking about it, that that was so strange, we realized that it was because we were filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives you this power and this joy, this sense of peace, that knowing even if your life is in danger, you don't have to fear it. You don't have to be intimidated. And it turned out later on down the road that we were able to pray with him, reconnect him with his mother, He had been going to harvest for a while and then kind of ran away from home. And so we reconnected him with his mother and hopefully he went back to to harvest and and so forth. He never did show us the gun. He didn't say if he had it or not. And we've been shot at before, driving down the road there on on Mission Boulevard. You can see the bullet ricochets on the window and things like this. Just because of the enemy, I don't think they were purposely saying, oh, there's Christians. You know, it was all of a sudden you hear this gun and ping, and it was just like right where I'm driving and it just hit the window and ricocheted off. Didn't stop us though. What we need is a filling of the Holy Spirit, a separation unto God, knowing that we're called for a purpose. Are we able to do something like that? See, someone can't take away your salvation, your eternal state. He said in verse 15, he gives us the answer how we can do this, is sanctify the Lord God in your heart. The word God there is actually Christ. Sanctify Christ in your heart. Set him apart in your heart. Make him your focus. He is the center of your life. He is your existence. He's the reason that you're here. We really need to do that. We don't do that enough. We're too busy because we are spoiled living in the United States. Let's go to Magic Mountain. Let's go to Nuts Berry Farm. Let's have a couple's dinner. And I'm all for couple's dinners. You know, don't get me wrong. But where was everybody in the morning to go out and share the message with the community? There were two or three people compared to 30-something at the dinner because we're spoiled. And we don't want to do things like that. You know? And we need to. We need to before God begins to allow persecution. Set Him apart in your heart. Let Him be your focus point. And instead of being afraid, as Peter says here, sanctify Christ as your Lord instead of worrying what's going on. Now let me stop here for a second because this next statement, I want to spend a little bit of time on it, not too much. And I want to exhaust this because Peter's whole purpose is here is that even though you're suffering and being persecuted, keep in mind 
to share the gospel, the whole purpose that Christ came for, to die for the sins of the world and give eternal life to those who would believe in him. So Peter says, and always, so sanctify the Lord God in your heart, sanctify Christ in your heart, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. So always be ready. Now the word ready there means a state of preparedness or readiness. To give, and to give is emphasizing the readiness, the idea of being ready. So be ready and then be ready to give it out. So don't just be ready and not do anything with it, but then give it out. You know what ready means? Prepare yourself. Prepare for battle. Get into it. Study it. You don't become a police officer without shooting that gun. You have to ready yourself. You don't become a police officer without going through the training of how to wrestle someone down and and stop them and handcuff them and do all those things. You have to be ready. You have to be ready. I even believe that moms need to be ready before their moms. And that's why they're hanging around their mom all day long to get themselves ready for when they become moms. It's a readying aspect of our life. And so is the preaching of the gospel message, the defense, the reason why we believe. We need to be ready with it. How are you readied? Getting into the Word of God. Studying it and so forth, you know? Because we're spoiled, though, we don't do it. You know, your churches, they... They take time to put material together. They pray about it and they're hoping to equip you so that you are ready and so forth. So they'll they'll make tracks like this. It's a beautiful track. And we probably bought about 500 of them. And they're still there. No one's really taken them. We should have at least 10 of these in our pockets or in our cars. And even just putting them on the door window next as you come out of the store or whatever and just putting it here and there, leaving it. I know people go into restaurants and they just leave one on the table, a card or something. Always being ready to share the gospel with people. It's not difficult to do. Even studying this is not difficult to do, to just go through it and memorize it. What is sin? What does sin do? What if someone asks you a question about sin? Well, what is sin? At least you can answer them. Well, so what we sin? Everybody sins. They all have a skeleton in the closet. Yeah, but don't you understand the wages of sin and you're able to answer them? But what does that mean? That means that you're going to be separated from God for eternity unless you turn to God. Well, how do I do that? And you can answer them by studying. It's not a lot to study. It's very simple, but we get complacent. We think the pastor's job is to do that, you know, or the evangelist group and so forth. No, it's our responsibility to be ready to give a defense. A defense to everyone who asks. Are they asking? Are they asking you about your faith in Jesus Christ? Do they see the light? Do they see the salt? Do they see that you're different? You know, do they see that you don't cuss, you don't swear? You know, that, that something's different about you? And then why are you different? Oh, you notice that? Well, let me tell you. It's because I'm a Christian. Oh, okay, you're one of those Bible thumpers. Well, no, I don't, I don't thump the Bible. I just read it. You know, I just study it because I want to know Jesus closer, right? Oh, you're one of those freaks. No, I'm not a freak. I'm just in love. And when you're in love, you know, you just want to spend time with that person. It's not freakish. I mean, didn't you love your wife at one time? Oh, no, me and my wife aren't getting along. See? Well, there you go. You need Jesus because he'll get you back together. And he'll bring your love together and so forth. You know? And you get opportunities like that because they see the difference in you. And they'll ask. Believe me, they'll ask when they see it in you. Even your enemies one day will ask you. And so don't worry about your enemies. Don't worry what people are saying because when it comes right down to it, they see the difference in you and they will come to you. They will come to you. I had a girl who actually was a Christian. She came from one of these um, churches that believed that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were all God, but the same person. And so Jesus was the Father Jesus was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was the Father and, and Jesus. So it was really confusing. They weren't three separate persons like we believe and that they're all God. And so she'd always argue over the fact that Jesus was the Son of God. And so we'd get into these, these heated arguments and so forth. Then one day she, uh, she was kind of crying and so forth. And I, I noticed that. So I just kind of praying in, underneath my breath and, 
And, and between our jobs, she came over and she said, would you mind praying for me? I said, sure, not a problem. What's going on? And she had just had a miscarriage. <clears throat> and so I said, oh, definitely. You know, I prayed right there with her and so forth, just compassionately uh, and lovingly shared with her Jesus and in his name, you know, and prayed. And it just changed our whole relationship. See, they might be your enemy, but when it comes right down to it, when they're hurting and they have no answers, they're going to come to you because you are different. And you have the answers to share with them if you're in the word of God. It's the hope, right? It's the whole reason, the hope that we have in Jesus. There are some Christians that don't have that hope. They're thinking, I'm afraid to die. Why are you afraid to die? Because pain and the suffering. But he suffered and he had pain. And that's part of dying. And you get to go to heaven immediately afterwards. That's the rejoicing, the birth of a plant, the birth of a butterfly. You know, that's an awesome thing. Yeah, it is awesome. Oh, I'm ready to die. You know, instead of just thinking of the pain and the suffering, it's an opportunity. You know, it's the hope that's in us. And Christians don't walk around that way. They're hopeless. Well, nothing ever works. Nothing's ever right. You know, and it just seems like that. And it really isn't true because with God, all things are possible when we believe in Him. So we have this hope, and and hope is always that thing that we're hoping for, right? You know, we know it's going to happen. We know we're going to get out of this situation. It's kind of like the people in the concentration camp. Studies have found that the people that survived were the people that had hope. They always had hope. We're going to get out of here. I just know we're going to get out of here. Millions died in the concentration camp. But some got out. And they had the hope. Someone will help us. Someone will be sent here. And they'll get us out of this situation. And they were helped. And it was the hope in them that kept them alive. You know, oftentimes I hear people talk about the, th the thing in war, in their situations, the thing that kept them alive was the fact of their wife and thinking of them or their children and so forth. And this is all hope. When we have Christ and we think of Him and His great work, we have hope in Him and there's purpose behind it, we get through these things. We definitely do. Because there is persecution there's persecution in our lives. There's a story that I read. I happened to be looking up on the internet and, and this story ca uh, came up. Uh, Duid is his name. He's, he was a Muslim and he became a Christian. And it talks about his experience as a Christian in, Muslim, uh, in a Muslim nation and the persecution that he suffered but also Christians suffered because of their faith. Let me share with you what he said. I think that being a Christian in the Middle East is just like being a Christian anywhere else. That's what he thought. He said, we get, suffer we get sufferings here and we're persecuted. And I thought it should be like that anywhere being a Christian because people don't like Christians. He didn't realize how spoiled we are here in the United States. He commented, if you are a Christian in the Middle East, you'll suffer. You'll see persecution as a gift, though, he said. If you are a Christian, no matter where you are, you will suffer. But it is very difficult to live your faith out here. He also says that he was a member of a legally registered church. So this was a legal church that the government allowed to be there. As long as they did not share their faith with others, they were fine. It was when they began to share their faith with others that they would get persecuted. So he explains that Muslims and Christians were able to live together side by side, but the problem started when Christians tried to reach out and share their faith. And so you found ways to do that. And so you would meet in a Muslim cab car. You would meet you know, outside in the coffee shops, or you'd find, find a place that was secure, and you can kind of share the gospel with them. But what he also said was they knew that you were a Christian. Because you no longer dress like a Muslim. You dress differently. Even the women would not wear the veils, and so they knew who the Christians were. You stuck out like a sore thumb. And so you were persecuted because of that difference. But he still took the opportunity to share his faith. Do we stick out like a sore thumb? Do people know that we're Christians? And do they ask us about our faith? Because we should. We should stick out. How important is sharing the gospel message? It is the greatest thing you could ever do. It is a great opportunity, and it is a blessing to share that message. 
I remember having a job, <clears throat> and earlier in my walk, I was very passionate about sharing the gospel message. In fact, I thought I was going to be more of an evangelist than a teacher. And I just love sharing my faith. I mean, I've seen people get on their knees and accept Jesus Christ. Friends of mine at work, families get on their knees, accept Jesus Christ. Strangers accept Jesus Christ. Christians come back to the Lord. You know, hundreds, I've seen, I would probably say about four to 500 people that I have personally led or have brought back to the Lord. You know, a, a lot of fruit there that I just lost because I just told you. <laughs> Hopefully not, Lord. But I've seen it because of the passion that God's given me for the loss. And I remember this one guy, I went to test his meter. And I just looked for opportunities. It was my whole vision. My whole goal was to share with somebody somehow, some way, find a way. You know, and so we're talking and I'm testing his meter, why his bill's so high and so forth. And, and then he says, oh, you have any hobbies? And I'm like, ding, 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 hobbies. And I'm just like, oh, you just opened up the door. I go, Yeah. I love studying the Word of God. And his whole demeanor, oh, you're, <clears throat> I go to church, you know. And so now we're talking about church, you know, and, and, and going to church and different churches. And then he starts asking me questions, why they do this, why they do that, and so forth. I didn't have all the answers, but I was able to lead him to the Lord. And this was a customer on Edison time, you know, as I was testing his meter. Those are opportunities that we get because we're always ready to share the gospel message. And when we share, we share it with meekness and fear. Meekness and fear, as he says here. Now, I haven't always been this way with meekness and fear and the fact that I've shared that way. I mean, there are times where I don't. I'm like John the Baptist. You know, we're like, repent, turn from your sins, you vipers, you, you den of little snakes, you know, before God's wrath comes upon you. I think from time to time that may be needed, you know, and I've been accused of being very harsh and mean at, at sharing my faith. Peter here says, do it with meekness and fear. The word meekness is saying, you know you have all this control and power. Just keep it under control. You know, and when you do it, don't fear reverence what you're doing. So I think we need to be careful how we share that it does come off loving, that you do care about them. I used to listen to Bob Larson, if those of you ever hear Bob Larson years ago, 19 years ago or so. He used to come on. And he was always very harsh in the beginning, and then he would get very loving as he continued on in the conversation. He would talk to a lot of cultists, satanic uh, people, and he'd get on, you're satanic, and he'd scream and yell at them. And then they were screaming and yelling, and then all of a sudden, why are you in that? Oh, my dad this, did this, or my mom did this, or my uncle abused me. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. And that's sad, that shouldn't have happened. But you know Christ, you know, and it just turned around and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, this guy's confessing Christ on the radio. You know, and it's just amazing how he had that ability to do that. And sometimes I think I could do that where, where I get into it and then all of a sudden turn it around, you know, to where the person will humble themselves and ask Christ into their hearts. I don't believe there's one way of doing it. God made you who you are and you preach it the way that you are, and he'll bring the people that will be affected by who you are. But I think we need to apply the, the meekness and the gentleness with it and with reverence, with reverence. So, you know, we're not prosecuting attorneys. You're guilty and you're going to hell. Boom, mallet down, you know, that type of thing. You know, I was speaking with some Jehovah Witnesses yesterday, and I was trying to be very loving with them. You know, I just said, I've got a question for you. You know, how, how are you saved? How do you get to heaven? And I noticed that one of the gals was interested in what I was saying. And so as I was talking with her, it turns out that she was upset that the church, she went to Baptist, Lutheran, Methodist, because as a little kid, I grew up in the church. But they never told me the name of God. Said so his name is Jehovah. And when I came to the Jehovah Witnesses, they told me his name. I go, and that's why you came to the Jehovah Witnesses? I go, it's in the Old Testament. It's the capital L-O-R-D. That's Jehovah. It's just in English. No, they shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have changed the word of God like that. They should have used the word Jehovah. Well, then why didn't they just write it all in Hebrew? You know, I mean, why are you making that point? You know, the reason that you are is because they found an area that touched you and they sucked you in, you know. And then I said, let me ask you a question. Go to John chapter 1. Read that for me. And she read it. And at the end it says, in the, in the original, it says Jesus was God. They change it to a God. And I says, why did you put an A there? Oh, because it clarifies the text. 
I go, wait a minute, you just told me not to, that they changed the word of God, and now you're telling me you changed the word of God, and then you told me that, that that was bad of them, that they've never read Revelation that talks about not changing the word of God, but it's okay for you to change the word of God? She's like, oh, but we did it because we love people and we want them to really know the truth. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. And you know that doesn't belong there. Oh, we know it doesn't belong there. Hello, wake up. You know, and she just couldn't see it. She just couldn't see it. So I, I tried to plan as much as I could. And the other lady came by and said, come on, he's going to confuse you. Let's go. You know. And then finally I told him, you know, yeah, I'm a pastor of a church. And then she's like, oh, let's really go. Come on. You know, so I, you know, I, I left them with, I think, a loving, in a loving way. And I think she had questions. I think I planted seeds and I, I watered. And we'll leave the rest up to God. You know, we're not pros- prosecutors. We're just to share the gospel and let God do the rest. He goes on, let's finish up. Having a good conscience. Now, what is Peter's saying here is knowing our testimony with God. We know who he is. We know the power that he has. He created the heavens and the earth. He divided the seas. He empowered, empowered the disciples to preach the gospel, to be martyrs to Christ. We know all of that. So knowing all that, that when they defame you, oh, I lost my place. I've got to stop doing that. So when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be shamed. And so because you know your your truth and you know the word and you know your life that even when they defame you don't let it bother you don't let it bother you continue on for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil than for doing evil there's a story in the daily bread of a man they called Joseph it wasn't his real name but he was a a model military officer all the way up to the rank of colonel and he had an opportunity to to work in an area, a region, where there was heavy drug trafficking. And so he enjoyed that opportunity to protect the people there in that area. And as he was protecting them and bringing them to jail and sentencing them, just having a a great success at it, some of the leadership within the uh, forces there who were taking bribes and drug money and helping the runners began to put pressure on him to turn the other way so that he didn't see what was going on, and to allow it. And he refused to do so. So immediately afterwards, they arrested him. And he spent eight years in prison. Eight years eight years for doing good. That's persecution. We don't often suffer that, but it happens. How are you going to live? And under pressure, will you cave in? Or will you pick up the sword, the word of the God, and will you preach that word? We need to preach it even, even for living for righteous sake. Now, <clears throat> as I said earlier, this eight-year-old wrote these notes and I was just blessed. She made this envelope and she took notes and this is what she said on the envelope. Be ready to answer questions about the word and asking questions about the word. God is your hope. So if you have problems, pray to God. Do not be all quiet. Speak the word of God. Don't worry if someone gets mad. You just love them. We get thrown in prison sometimes for doing good, but just have faith. We have choices to stand for Christ or for God or to back away from God. I thought, wow. And that's just the envelope. And then she wrote all of this. Eight years old. I'm ashamed. And she just wrote all her points, the scripture reference, and she put hope. People are saying that Allah is God, and those people are asleep. I, I was sharing how today there's a, there's a christenum, they call it christenum, where they're taking Christianity and Islam and bringing it together. And they're saying our Father God in Christianity is the same as Allah, and that's not true. And she heard that, and she wrote it down that it's not true. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just want to read uh, this part down at the bottom. You can open up your house and give people food, but if you don't tell people the word, it is not true love. Be ready to tell the word to people that don't know it. Don't know it. 
See, because you can have all the love in the world. You can help them financially. You can feed them. You can clothe them. But without Christ, they're going to die. And true love is sharing the gospel message with people as hard as it is. You care about their souls, then you're going to share the answer to save their souls. It's that simple.